everybody, welcome back. I am here again with Dr. Granoff and we are talking about statistics and I am learning a lot, hopefully you are too. Um, as a reminder, the materials that we're talking about, those are available for download. And Dr. Granoff is also available for you to pick his brain. He does um, Saturday sessions and I'll put all the information in the comments so that you can access that session um, if you'd like to meet with him and um, get his opinion on your specific work and what you're doing for your dissertation. So we wanted to talk today about um, rating scales. Um, and Dr. Granoff has uh, some examples here. I think you mentioned earlier, you're a collector of um, these types of scales. So tell us a little bit about um, these scales and what do we need to know? As Rebecca was saying, I have over the years collected different examples of rating scales. Often when I work with people, they're developing surveys that they need to somehow measure their information. And so, you know, having taught grad school for, I don't know, 25 years or so, I've just collected different things as examples. Uh, these are ordinal level scales, meaning that you can put things in order from lower to higher, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have precise measurement here. As an example, uh, number three there, strongly disagree, moderately disagree, slightly neutral, slightly agree, moderately agree, strongly agree. You can see that there's an, a continuum there from strong disagreement to strong agreement, and it goes from low to high, but you really don't have a lot of precision in the uh, the, the metrics there. Mm. So there's different scales. That's a common one. Another the common one, one from um, one of my instruments used that scale. Uh huh. Another common is scale number one, which is looking at the frequency of an occurrence from never to always. Ah, you know, okay. If we're doing a if we're doing a leadership study, you know, how often do you compliment an employee when they've turned in their work. Oh, I never do it. I sometimes do it. No, I always do it. So it's rating the, the frequency of occurrence. Okay. A third example, if you could scroll down a bit, please. Sure. Number 17 there is very poor to very good. Sometimes in some kinds of studies, you're looking at the quality asking people for their opinions on quality, ah, whether okay. something is poor to very good. For example, if you're looking at um, employees and job satisfaction, you'd ask them about the quality of the, the benefit package that they're given. Do they mm -hmm. think the package is very poor? Do they think it's average? Is it good or is it very good? So then that one's looking at uh, that. Couple other couple other specialty ones. Go up to number two, please. Sure. Oh. I have found this one to be very helpful as part of a brainstorming process. Mm. Where if you're doing, for example, program evaluation and you're asking people, well, what should we, you know, what are some ideas on what we should do in the future? And they put everything up on the board and anything from Oh, we should, you know, double people's salaries to bring in kangaroos and all the other things that happens in uh, that. The second step is that you then write down all those things. You give them back the list and you ask them to rate the responses. Interesting. Like how well do you think this would work in our organization? Yes. And so then, so, so, and because often what happens is whoever had them do the brainstorming, now they're stuck with a list of 100 things. They don't know where to go with it. Right. So as a way to summarize it, you, you, you feed the list back to the individuals and you have the group rate each idea on its feasibility. I like that. So then you can, you'll want to focus on the ones that the, the highest rating of you know, like a four or a five or something. So that's helpful from that standpoint. Okay. You could use that in, um, I'm just thinking about it from a dissertation perspective. If you were talking to 
teachers and mm -hmm. different reading interventions or yes um, you know things like that you could use a scale like this yes a, a quick story my uh my son went through boy scouts and i was one of the scout leaders one of the traditions we have is that after they go on a camping trip when they're you know tired of eating their own food and we go to mcdonald's and get burgers and fries we have the uh, senior patrol leader go with through a evaluation process with the group saying start stop continue and and basically yeah. what it is is hey guys we had this great camping trip what should we start doing in the future to make the next trip even better so that's the innovation and everyone gives their ideas and they have somebody write it down yeah. the second one after start is stop what should we stop doing mm -hmm. that just didn't seem to work and it's wasting our time or it wasn't fun, or maybe we should not do this in the future. And then the third one, we have start, we have stop, and then we have continue, which is pulling out the best practices. Yeah, what's working well. Right, so doing start, stop, and continue, and then following up with scale number two, to yeah. have them then rate things, you can do a nice program evaluation after something that happens and that could be that could be part of a nice case study. Yeah. That you're going into an organization and you bring out the decision makers and they come up with their list and they do something like that. So that's a possibility for that. That's a great idea. Scroll down to the bottom here. There's one more example that I want to bring out here. Uh, number 27, much more like group B, somewhat more, slightly more groups A and B are similar slightly more for group A, somewhat more, much more for group A. How I, I think I came up with this. I don't, I don't, there's nothing new under the sun, but this, this was kind of developed out of necessity. I was working with a gentleman who was a political activist and he worked with Armenian politicians who lived in Glendale, California, where they have a large Armenian population. And so he was a political activist trying to get the Armenians in office and all that. So his dissertation was looking at the characteristics of Armenian, pol or the leadership characteristics of Armenian leaders. Interesting, okay. So he used the leadership practice inventory. Some of you may know it, may have learned it from Kuznis and Posner and the leadership challenge book. Um, the leadership practice inventory has 30 statements related to transformational leadership. Yeah. So before he interviewed each person, he had them fill out the 30 statements and use the scale we have in number 27 there. But his anchor points, instead of group B, that was looking at non-Armenian politicians, where group A was Armenian politicians. So what he was looking to do was differentiate and one of the unique things of Armenian politicians. And so they rated that. And then this became the prompt for him when he interviewed them. So what he would say is, so Mr. Nazarian, I saw that you said for that setting an example of, of, of best practice is much more important for Armenian politicians. Please tell me about that. And oh, so yeah. then he got a lot of flavor quotes about what, what was the unique essence of being an Armenian politician. So that's another way of using this. That's interesting, yeah. It's, um, when I was thinking about this, it, my study was looking at group differences, but I just did the quantitative approach. So just looked at the math around it based on work engagement and psychological capital. But had I done, had I wanted to do more, had I, you know, been able to do more, I could have taken that quantitative approach and done something like this to dig in a little bit more and do some, you know, focus groups or interviews to understand why, um, you know, it's different between the two groups. So this is, this is good for a qualitative approach but for looking mm -hmm. at. It's really great. So you just did stats where you said, Oh, what's the average of group one compared to the average of group two? 
Right. Okay. All right. Yep. Yeah. Short this is another it. way to do it for that. Yeah. And this would have gotten to the more meteor, you know, meteor content and a little bit more of um, the why and the context behind it. All right. Rebecca, could you scroll to page two, please? Absolutely. So to recap, on page one, we had all these examples of ordinal scales. Then there's other situations where you've got a construct and you just really don't know how to create a scale. So the second is about as comprehensive a list of things as I could come up with through work with others where you can see at the top there, the example there is not at all descriptive, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, extremely descriptive. So one way to make a new scale is to take a set of a semantic differential, which are basically just antonyms, strong or weak, good or bad, powerful or powerless, traditional or progressive, permissive or restrictive, and you have a scale from one to seven. And that's another way to come up with ways to measure your constructs that is a little bit different and unique. That's interesting. So one would be not at all, seven would be absolutely. And then in the middle, you're not, you're not putting words to those numbers. You're allowing the respondent to kind of gauge- Shades the of gray. Interesting. And so this is our presentation on ordinal rating scales. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And again, everybody, this is available to download. Um, Dr. Granoff has kindly granted us permission to make these available. And his contact information is on each of these um, downloads if you have any questions for him.